we are going to solve the reversing challenge Zwiebel from the TUM CTF 2016 by creating a dynamic analysis script with Radare. Before I knew I would write a script for Radare, I had to figure out what the binary is doing. So after I downloaded the binary and checked that it's a 64-bit Linux binary, I made sure my Vagrant Linux VM is running and opened the binary for first analysis in Binary Ninja. Let's head to main and start reversing. So first we have a printf that is asking for the input key. The valid input key is probably also our flag. The f flush just makes sure that the output is displayed and not held in a buffer. After that we have an f gets, which means that the input key string is read. The RDI register is commonly used as the destination, so this memory with the flag symbol name is probably where our input key is stored. Finally, we can also see that it's not just zeros, but already initialized with some fake flags. Then we see an mmap, which is directly followed by a memcopy, which means that the program wants a new memory segment for something and copies some data to that new segment. Because we have a reversing challenge, it's not unlikely that it might have some self-modifying code that uses this new memory. It looks like it is copying SHC, which probably stands for shellcode, to this new address, which is in register R14. Now, when you look at SHC, you can see this chunk of pretty random looking data, and it's also pretty long. Hmm. After it copied this long memory to the new mmap memory segment, it will perform a call to R14, and R14 contains the address of the new memory segment. So it will jump to this code. This means that SHC contains actually some assembler code. So we can go there and press P to tell Binary Ninja it should make this an assembler procedure. Switch to graph view to make it easier to understand the flow. The first meaningful instruction here is the move from RBX to RAX. And if you paid attention to the move before the call to R14, you know that RBX contains the address to our input key. This means that RAX points to that address and it will get the first byte of it in AL. Then it will perform a binary AND with hex 4.0. Let's have a look at 4.0 in binary. You can see it has only one bit set. So if our input character has this bit set, the result will be non-zero. Thus the JE jump equal, which is the same as jump if zero, will not jump and continue over here. If the input character would not have this bit set, it will jump to the left and perform two syscalls, a right and then an exit. So this is not where we want to go. This means the first character has to have this bit set to one. In this branch, we immediately notice a loop which contains an XOR. Inside of this loop, memory at the location of RSI is XORed with whatever is in EAX. Then the address is incremented and we repeat the whole thing. After that, we jump somewhere. The jump target here looks a little bit meaningless, but that's probably because it's not real code yet. This loop seems to decrypt the next layer of assembler and then jumps there. Layer, get it? Zwiebel is German for onion, so looks like we removed the outer layer of the onion. We could now use the XOR key and decrypt the code and proceed, but at this point I decide that I want to see it executing. So I copy the binary to the shared folder so I can access the executable in the Linux VM. Then I connect to the Linux system with SSH and execute it. So we get the input key prompt and the sad smiley for failing the key check. Now let's open it with GDB. But if we run it in GDB, it immediately gives us a sad smiley without even asking for the key. What's going on? When we execute it with strace, we get a bit more information. If we look closely, we can see a failed P trace in there. This looks like a typical anti-debugging trick. How is this an anti-debugging trick? See, when GDB is debugging another process, or strace collecting a syscall trace, they both use the ptrace syscall to observe and control the execution of another process. But if the process is already traced by something, the kernel will return an error on calling ptrace. So the binary executes ptrace, basically trying to debug itself, and if that syscall fails, it knows that it's being debugged by something, and it will commit suicide. This is usually easy to defeat. So let's look for this in Binary Ninja. 
We notice here on the left that, indeed, the binary uses ptrace. If we follow the cross-reference, we find this function here using it, which has two options. One kills itself, the other just returns. So we can just knob this code here so it will always return and we should have defeated this anti-debugging trick. This is very easy with Binary Ninja and we can simply save the modified binary and call it Zwiebel2. When we now run it in GDB, we will get the key input prompt and it seems to work well. Great. Now we can continue with what we wanted to do. Let's set a breakpoint before we follow the call to R14 so we can observe the decryption. Now we can step single instructions forward. Awesome. Here at the move to AL, we can see that it references the flag, which has our input AAA. And we can see the AND happening. Because character capital A is hex 41, the binary AND result will be non-zero and we continue to the decryption loop. If you look closely at where the jump afterwards would go, you see that when we execute the XOR decryption, the code is changing. So it really is decrypting the next layer. Let's set a breakpoint after the decryption loop before we jump into the new code and continue. Then we hit that breakpoint and we can single step forward and look at the new decrypted code. Huh, that looks interesting, look at that. It again loads the flag into RAX, but instead of loading the first character into AL, it loads the character at offset hex 1D. Then it again performs a binary AND operation, this time with 2. 2 in binary also has only one bit set. So this is also a check if a certain character has a certain bit set. And following this check, we see another XOR decrypt loop. Basically the same thing like before. So we can set another breakpoint after the loop and see how that decrypt code looks like. And what a surprise, it's basically the same thing over again. Another character is taken, checked if a certain bit is set, and then continues with another decrypt loop. We slowly peel that onion layer by layer and we get an idea of what it is doing. So let's back off for a second and recap. The code performs the same actions over and over again. It will first check a certain character if a bit is set. If that bit is set, it will decrypt the next layer. In that new decrypted layer, it checks another character's bit and decrypt the next layer, and so on. Based on the two layers we have already seen, we know that the first character has to have bit 6 set to 1 and character 29, uh, hex 1D, has to have the bit 1 set. We can imagine now that this will go on for quite a while and slowly tells us all the bits it checks. So if we collect all those rules, we can recover an input that passes all those checks. Now we have to think about how we could do that. There are multiple options and I've thought about what could be the fastest during the CTF, but it kind of depends what you know. If you are good with Binary Ninja plugins, you could build a static analysis tool that decrypts everything and then you simply extract the disassembled code. But I don't have that experience yet, so I chose Radar2. Because Radar2 is super simple to script with Python and R2Pipe. So the plan is to debug the binary with Radar like we did with GDB and then always extract the bit rule. Find the jump address after the decrypt loop, let it decrypt and continue to the next rule. To get this started, make sure Radar is up to date. Always run sys install.sh. It takes a while, but Radar is heavily developed that if you have any issue, don't bother asking people if you are not on the latest commit. After that, you can install R2Pipe for Python with pip install R2Pipe. Now you can import R2Pipe in Python and use it like you would use Radar. In the next video, we will create the script that will extract all rules and recover the flag.